Hello, this is Boo! As my incredibly lame attempt has just proven, it's difficult to scare people. I'm sure, a well-timed cat in the shower will always make someone jump, but true terror is often difficult to come by, especially in video games. Yeah. Crap. You know, I... Scary video games entered a renaissance with the introduction of the survival horror genre. Brought to prominence with Resident Evil in 1996, which has become the godfather of such games. By mixing elements of action, adventure, and creepy atmosphere, this set the stage for what people would come to expect from the newly popular genre. This was helped in no small part by the three-dimensional capabilities of the newly minted PlayStation console. Even Alone in the Dark, a very early survival horror title originally released in 1992 for the PC, used rudimentary three-dimensional graphics to help wed an action-adventure game mechanic with horror which is critical when distinguishing between survival horror and just a horror-themed action game, like Nightmare on Elm Street for the NES. The psychological horror subgenre specifically got a post-Resident Evil boost with games like Silent Hill and Eternal Darkness. Though both are still action-adventure games at their core, the horror atmosphere is elicited less from jump scares and overt staples of modern horror fiction, like zombies, and more from invoking a creeping feeling of dread in the player by tinkering with their mind. As you might expect, stuff like the Lovecraftian mythos is more bread and butter here than Night of the Living Dead. And though it may not be readily apparent, there were a few survival horror entries, besides Alone in the Dark, that predated Resident Evil and thus avoided a reliance on its action-oriented precedents. These games, being technologically inferior to Resident Evil in terms of three-dimensional graphics and gore, relied more on the aforementioned psychological horror that I personally find more effective in scaring the player. Furthermore, by preying on more cerebral fears, these games weren't necessarily constrained to being straight action adventures. One example is Sweet Home, which was a JRPG for the Famicom and ironically is credited as an influence for Resident Evil seven years later. The game splits up the main party and forces the player to choose a set of weaknesses for each group as they explore a mansion full of nasty surprises. Add to that a true penalty system that keeps dead characters dead, no Phoenix Downs here, and you'll quickly come to appreciate the horror elements at play and anxious feelings they evoke. By the way, for a great recap of Sweet Home and why you need to play this Japan exclusive title, I recommend you watch the Happy Video Game Nerd's comprehensive video about it. Another example of an early survival horror forebear is the focus for today's episode, a pre-Resident Evil survival slash psychological horror game named Clock Tower. Originally released only in Japan for the Super Famicom in 1995, this is an incredibly unique game that deserves a spot as a Halloween classic in any gamer's library. Though gameplay-wise it's best described as a point-and-click adventure, it also seamlessly blends elements of action and stealth, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The game was developed by Human Entertainment, which you may know from some of their releases on the NES, such as Gilligan's Island, an interesting if extremely flawed experiment, and Monster Party, which was a much better effort and has since become a cult favorite. Clock Tower became one of Human Entertainment's most popular titles in Japan, before the company disbanded in 1999. It spawned two sequels, a spin-off, and a spiritual successor in a PlayStation 2 game known as Haunting Ground. These four games earned mainstream releases in North America on Sony consoles, with Clock Tower 2 being released in the US under the misleading name of Clock Tower. Meanwhile, the original Clock Tower was never officially distributed in the West, but did see a re-release in Japan as Clock Tower The First Fear for PlayStation, Wonderswan, and PC. This port added a few new scenes, some new sound effects, and full motion video, of course, but otherwise is the same game as the Super Famicom original. Unlike some gems, you don't want to pass by Clock Tower's story. It's truly integral to the experience. It begins with your character, Jennifer Simpson, as she and three of her friends arrive at their new home. You see, the four girls are parentless, and the local orphanarium has managed to find a kind-hearted recluse in a huge foreboding mansion that's willing to take them in, and they all lived happily ever after. Oh right, except for the raving homicidal maniac. Shortly before beginning the game, Jennifer and her friends will be accompanied into the front hall by Ms. Mary, the recluse's wife, who then walks off. After a while, Jennifer leaves the room to find Mary, but then the lights go out. Jennifer hears a scream, and her friends mysteriously disappear. From here, full control is turned over to you. You'll quickly learn that this game is a non-linear exercise in terror. 
the first thing you'll notice is a mouse pointer on the screen. There's a fine stable of PC to SNES ports that include such mechanics, like SimCity or Civilization, but strangely, Clock Tower was designed for the Super Famicom, and a PC port only came out years later. So, Human Entertainment made a bit of a bold move here with their interface, but it generally works well. As I stated earlier, more than anything else, Clock Tower resembles a point-and-click adventure, but without a list of commands to type or select from, like you'd find in Maniac Mansion, for example. Instead, the gamepad is integrated rather ingeniously with the pointer on the screen. If you'd like to check out a certain item in a room, move the cursor over and click it. In fact, if you move the cursor over an item that you can actually interact with, the game will pull the pointer right over the item and change it to a box. That's helpful since using the D-pad to move a cursor around is always tricky. However, I can't help but think that a great opportunity was missed by not including support for the Super NES mouse. To walk in a certain direction, click to the right or left of Jennifer double-click to run. However, running is also mapped to the shoulder buttons, which is my preferred method of movement should something nasty happen to show up suddenly. Beyond that, the X button will stop Jennifer's movement, which I found extremely useful after clicking the wrong item one too many times. Meanwhile, the A button brings up the item screen. Not that there are a huge amount of items per se, but the ones you do find will likely have an important purpose. Very quickly in your travels, you'll be introduced to... Yeah, him. Bobby. Which is his actual name in the game. Or as he's come to be known more colloquially, and unfortunately, Scissor Man. Though I like to stay away from that moniker, since it brings the image to my mind of a Mega Man villain. This is the homicidal Pepe Le Pew to your terrified cat with a white stripe. Always punctuated by the same pulse-pounding music, he'll chase you throughout the house until you can find a hiding place and wait him out, or otherwise trick him into a trap, which still only temporarily detains him. This is where the stealth aspect of the game comes into play. There are no weapons to speak of in this game. It's just your wits versus a killer. If Bobby does catch up with you, he'll attack with his Giga Shears, which you'll have a chance to block via the game's panic mode. You see, when in danger, Jennifer's portrait in the bottom left corner of the screen will flash red and blue. This is panic mode, and your cue to mash that B button as fast as you can. If you're quick enough, you'll repel the attack and have another chance to escape. If you're not, well, you're knocked down for the count as Bobby dances his little kill dance. Panic mode won't just come up during close encounters with Bobby, but pretty much any time Jennifer's in a position where something may be about to kill her, and unsurprisingly, that's quite often in this house. Anytime you fail, the game ends and tells you, dead end. Which isn't quite as punitive as you think. It just means that the title screen comes up and you can continue right from the room you left off. That doesn't seem nearly enough of a penalty for dying. I mean, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but a system similar to early Resident Evil games where you could only save in certain rooms, and even then only a limited number of times, would have been a big improvement in upping the fear factor here. It forces the player to be more careful and strategize about save points. Sure, it was annoying, but you can't deny it added an extra sense of danger in Resident Evil. As it stands, this method of death and continue makes the game a bit too easy. The user interface is purposefully sparse so as not to detract from the game's atmosphere, but there is a life meter of sorts in Jennifer's portrait. This gives an indication of her mood, whether she's feeling fine or is scared out of her wits. A variety of background colors tell the true story here, from blue, good, to red, panic, but the facial expressions are a great touch. Whenever Jennifer witnesses something disturbing or is running for too long, her mood will darken and you'll have to find a quiet spot to rest so she can regain her sanity. It's a good idea to keep Jennifer in as stable a mood as possible, since a weakened state will reduce the probability that you can survive a panic mode when it inevitably comes at you. Not to mention you're more prone to trip over your own feet while Bobby's chasing you if your mood is not up to par. And speaking of the little maniac, Bobby will keep popping up somewhat at random throughout the game, so you'll need to be on your toes. And when I say random, I mean it. Oh, sure, there are certain areas that are pre-programmed to be Bobby spawn points, but they won't always be active. Every time you go through the game, you can never tell exactly how events will play out, and that's one of the big draws of this game. It's randomness. Each time you begin anew, the mansion is slightly different. Some rooms move around, and items can change places. You can't just sleepwalk through the game, no matter how many times you've played it. This adds a little bit to the replay value, but more importantly increases the tension inherent to the title. How surprised would you be walking into what you think is the cage room, only to find out it's the piano room, and Ceiling Bobby is watching you infiltrate? 
In that vein, Clock Tower features multiple endings that depend on your actions during the game. In fact, you'll find that almost every action has a consequence. Jennifer's goal is to find her friends and escape the mansion alive, but she can change the course of the story by simply witnessing certain events. It's like there's a quantum serial killer on the loose. As the story unfolds, you'll have a chance to unwind a tapestry concerning the mansion, its inhabitants, and even Jennifer's own past. I don't want to spoil anything, of course, but considering that Bobby makes his first appearance, one way or another, via the mutilated corpse of one of Jennifer's friends, it shouldn't take much to convince you that every plot turn is on the table. In all, there are nine different endings, rated from A to H, with an extra hard to achieve S-ranked finale at the very top. As you might imagine, the lower your letter grade, the crappier your ending will be. They range from Jennifer's grisly end to at least the possibility of escaping with some fraction of your friends intact. Completing multiple endings can help flesh out the plot, and it's certainly worth trying for as many as possible. At the very least, it helps elongate the replay value of an otherwise fairly short game. The graphics are simply beautiful. This game is all about atmosphere, and the designers at Human Entertainment provided it in spades. Avatars have fluid movements, and the mansion is finely detailed. Perhaps most striking are the portraits in the lower part of the screen. Jennifer's facial expressions are an innovative way to convey the emotions felt by her character as she copes with the traumatic events thrown at her. I actually think that the graphics are more effective than the 3D environments you'd find in Resident Evil or Silent Hill for the PlayStation, much in the same way that Super Mario World can look artistically better than Super Mario 64, in my opinion. The lack of a traditional music score during calmer portions of the game, which are instead punctuated by Jennifer's footsteps and the odd random noise, just adds immensely to the creepy atmosphere and punctuates points when you are in serious danger, since that's when the music comes in. For example, when walking around the house, you might sometimes hear a phone ring. When you actually find said phone, you'll learn the line's been cut. That truly brought me back to Eternal Darkness and its sanity effects, which were designed to play with your mind like that. Alright, here's full disclosure. I was recording footage for this game one night at around 1 in the morning. I know, I was just asking for trouble. Well, the house made one of those super loud creaks that sometimes happens when it's settling for the night, and I literally jumped out of my chair. The cat sitting in my lap was not pleased, and left marks proving such. This is my warning to you. Clock Tower manipulates your mind. And that's what I look for when I truly want to be scared by a horror game. My advice is to play it alone, at night, with all the lights off. Embrace the experience. Any fan of survival horror, especially psychological horror, owes it to themselves to play this game. Unfortunately, that's easier said than done. As I stated previously, Clock Tower never saw release outside Japan, but luckily, due to the diligence of friendly neighborhood ROM hacker Gideon Z over at Eon Genesis, an English patch was released over a decade ago. So yes, this does mean you'll have to dirty yourself with the big E if you're not a student of Japanese. To help alleviate a guilty conscience and the possibility of a strike team of ninja lawyers breaking into your house, I strongly advise that you search out the original title on the used market. Again, easier said than done. The game has turned into a cult classic, and loose cartridges, even when they can be found on sites like eBay, will usually be priced in the $40 range. Double that for a boxed copy. But if you have the spare cash and a hankering to play one of the pioneers of the survival horror genre, you can't go wrong with this purchase. Simply put, there are a few, if any other, survival horror games for 16-bit consoles. So why not treat yourself this Halloween by crapping your pants old school style? This has been Roof with Clan of the Grey Wolf, and there is no reset button. Just an off switch. In a town in the woods at the top of a hill, there's a house where no one lives. So you take a big bag of your big city money there and buy it. But at night when the house is dark and you're all alone There's a noise upstairs At the top of the stairs there's a door And you take a deep breath and try it And the flashlight shows you something moving just inside the door There's a tattered dress and a feeling you have felt somewhere before